Good evening, everybody. This is Alex Books and my co-host here, Roger, Roger Sutherland of the uh, Guitar Gear Locker. And um, I'm happy to say I have my, my brother here, uh, Jeremy Wagner, as our guest tonight of Broken Hope. And also he has a new project, Earthburner, we can, we can get into as well. Uh, so this is uh, episode six. And uh, yeah, great to have you here, Jeremy. Thanks for uh, yeah. being on. Thanks for Thank being you, on. Great to meet you. Roger, for having me on. Appreciate it. Good talking to you okay. guys. Oh, yeah. Um, I guess we'll start off, you know, I wanted to ask, uh, you know, how, to, if you remember how you got into music, you know, was there a certain band or, or bands that kind of, you know, got that bug? Or yeah. was, there, was there a moment when you decided, I'm going to play guitar. This is what I want to do. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can distinctly remember um, when it comes to music and, and guitar playing, what are like very memorable, life-changing moments for me, you know? Um, so when I was growing up, uh, my mom and dad's side of the family, they were, were all from Chicagoland area. And um, I was uh, born in a, a town called Libertyville, Illinois, which uh, is actually the same hometown as uh, Tom Morello of Rage Against the Machine, mm. it's a northern burb up, up in the Chicagoland area. And when I was about three, my parents moved up to central Wisconsin. So like right dead center, middle of Wisconsin, dairy land, you know, like I lived out in the country. We lived on a farm. Uh, it wasn't a working farm, but we had a barn and outbuildings, but all the other farms and kids I went to school with all came from like working dairy farms. I, I remember, uh, like the grade school bus smelled like cow manure because the kids were <laughs> like up at 5 a.m. doing chores before they went to school, like crazy. Yeah, stuff like that. And my parents uh, had a ton of, of vinyl. And um, back then in the, you know, early 70s, mid 70s, um, you know, we didn't have cable TV or even satellite dish or anything. So um, to keep myself entertained, I listened to music a lot and read a lot of books. My mom has always been an avid reader. That's how I got into, you know, being a bookworm and eventually becoming a writer. And um, outside of that, just, you know, using my imagination. But when it came to music, um, the first band I fell in love with was the Beatles. I played mm -hmm. all my parents' Beatles albums uh, constantly. And um, even as a, a wee lad in kindergarten and first grade, I was also a hopeless romantic. I remember I had this girl that I liked in like first grade and I would call her on the phone and, and sing the lyrics to Yesterday by the Beatles <laughs> over the phone. <laughs> I, love, I, love, I love the Beatles and then um, uh, I and I still have like all my parents vinyl from, from back then another album that I was into was uh, Bob Dylan Blood on the Tracks and um, there's a song called Tangled Up in Blue and that was my favorite oh, song yeah. I would just play nice. it over and over again I scratch the shit out of that album because you know I'm like four years old, you know, trying to navigate a turntable to yeah. you know, listen to that over and over again. And um and then from there it was like um whatever came through the door that my parents had you know, from again Beatles, Bob Dylan to uh the cars to uh Frank Zappa um and couple bands I, I still love it really to this day are like early Neil Young albums and uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash, stuff like that. Um, and then once like I hit sixth grade going into seventh grade. I can't wait um, to hear what he sang this time. Um, that's when <laughs> like I started get, getting, learning what like hard rock and heavy metal was about. And when I was about 12 is when um, 
like screaming for vengeance came out and um that totally like changed my life that's to this day it's still my favorite priest album and i never heard anything like that and you know we all at this point in our lives know like priest's discography uh, most of us who are metal and so i didn't realize at the time that they'd been around since the 70s you know i just do this right album and uh, the, the the album cover and everything it just blew my mind and then from there then my taste got heavier and heavier as music became heavier and heavier so um, from you know 82 to 85 within three years um, a lot changed in the landscape of, of metal and you know by 84 um i now was listening to slayer and metallica's ride the lightning 1984 mm -hmm. very very important part of my timeline because that's the album that made me want to play gu guitar an electric guitar i wanted to do that i wanted to sound like make that noise that i was hearing mm -hmm. really um propelled me that album just blew me away you know when uh, people talk about like uh, famous events in history i remember where i was when this happened or whatever it's like right i remember where i was when i heard metallica's ride the lightning the thing about um that album was by by that time, 80, 84, you know, as a teenager, uh, that's the year I turned 14. Um, we didn't live in the country anymore. We moved to this nearby college town called Stevens Point. So now we had, for the first time, cable TV. We had a color television. We never had a color TV before. We had a VCR and like all this stuff like was in one way or shape or form was life-changing as well because like aside from music i'm a horror kid i've always been into horror since i was probably a toddler so having a vcr i was renting horror movies constantly and then watching mtv back when mtv played a lot of metal and stuff and i i just remember this one oh and i would record having a vcr i would record uh, heavy metal programs and videos uh, that were on MTV, right? So I had recorded this um, MTV, I think it was a special, it was called like Metal Mania or something on, on MTV. I think maybe mm -hmm. Snyder hosted this thing. It was like a two hour yeah. thing. And it was like live from Dan the Green, Oakland, California. And it was, you know, the legendary show you know with scorpions y&t ying vey malmsteen metallica mm -hmm. um and the little clip was i had already heard of metallica right um because i'd see their albums and their eps in record shops but um uh i came from a family at that point where I'm lit, had a sister, my younger sister, and my mom, a single mom. So we didn't have a lot of money. So I couldn't buy uh, albums all the time. I had a paper route and stuff and I was into BMX bikes. So all my money would mostly go into BMX bikes. And um, sometimes I'd buy, you know, cassette tapes here and there. And, uh, oh, and I also was working on piece by piece building like the biggest stereo system you could ever have in your life <laughs> so um there was this point around 83 and 84 where at the time by this time i had you know aside from screaming for vengeance uh those next three years and i was listening to um like i said slayer i was listening to um armored saint and crocus and uh, this band Kick Axe from Canada and Pile Driver and all this stuff. And um, Metallica, I again just saw their album covers, the vinyl and cassettes, but I 
didn't dip my toes in there because I would buy like a lot of people did that are my age now. Um, you would see an album cover and sometimes buy the album just because of the album cover if you didn't hear the music. Right. And like I, so I would see like Kill 'Em All and then Red the Lightning came out. Um, all they had like the Jump in the Fire EP and, and stuff. You know, I always thought the artwork was cool, the logo was cool, but I just didn't um, pull the trigger and buy Metallica. So what happened is, is so one day um, when I was watching Metal Mania the, from Day on the Green, there was a little clip of Metallica and they were playing Fight Fire with Fire. It's just a few seconds. I think you can find this on YouTube. And then it cuts to James Hetfield and Lars Ulrich backstage. Hey, this is James and this is Lars of Metallica and you're watching Metal Mania or something. So um, just that little few seconds of Fight Fire with Fire live, I rewatched that on VHS tape because I had recorded it over and over again. So I had the skateboard buddy, like a skateboard punk kind of guy, right? Um, mm -hmm. And his parents, I think, were either doctors or mm -hmm. professors maybe at the university in that town there. And they, they had money and they always bought this kid uh, whatever he wanted. And he had, he must have had like 200 cassette tapes of, and it was all metal, some punk, you know, hardcore, but mostly metal. And mm -hmm. uh, for me being a teenager um, uh, with, with a single mom and, you know, trying to save up money for cassette tapes, when I saw this kid had like 200 cassette tapes, just seeing that, I was like, holy shit, you're rich. You know, you're, you're my new friend. Yeah. <laughs> so one day we were at um, a record store in Stevens Point called Campus Records, which was on the campus of University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point. And that's where I got a lot of my cassette tapes from. Like, um, I remember that's like where I got Piledriver, Metal Inquisition and stuff. You know, they always had stuff. No other record store did. And uh I said to my friend, um, hey, with all the, those uh, cassettes you have, do you have, do you have anything from uh, that band Metallica? I couldn't even pronounce Metallica right. <laughs> oh, you mean Metallica? I go, yeah. yeah. And That's you think awesome. I know how, oh, because I watched James and Lars mention their names and the name of the band and didn't see anything mm -hmm. else, but... Um, he goes, yeah, they just came out with an album this year, Ryan the Lightning. Let's go to my house and you can check it out. So went to his house, went down in his basement. And again, that life-changing moment, he put on Ride the Lightning uh, and I was standing on his skateboard um, in front of his stereo, just kind of going back and forth on the skateboards, you know, and um First thing I hear is that that classical intro right before Fight Fire with Fire. And then the transition from that into Fight Fire with Fire, I was like, holy shit. That was like not what I was expecting. Because one, the classical yeah. intro threw me off. And then, man, when Ride the Lightning kicked in, I was just starting to be more and more like completely blown away. Like, what? what am I listening to? This is absolutely amazing. And then man, when for whom the bell tolls yeah. came on that intro so epic. And then the whole din, 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 din. I was just like, that was <laughs> it. and then I'm like, I, I, I want to, I want to play that, you know, yeah. I'm already in the metal and stuff, but that mm -hmm. album, that was the moment when I'm like, I want to get an electric guitar. I actually had a guitar uh, because I was always fascinated with the guitar. So mm -hmm. um, my I had an aunt who uh, was like a folk singer. So she was a really mm -hmm. amazing singer and guitarist. And I would screw around with trying to play her acoustic and stuff. And guitar was this so such a fascinating instrument to me. I was just like. Um, you know, how does it make these sounds? This is, is 
the coolest instrument in the world, right? So um, my mom got me an acoustic guitar for my birthday around age 12. And um, I don't know, like most kids, you know, like I, I wanted the guitar. I, I, I believe I asked for a guitar and then I didn't do shit with it. It just sat around, you know, and um, I'd screw around, try, you know, I didn't know how to play or anything. So I just break it out and, you know, strum it and stuff. So that all changed after Ride the Lightning. I really took guitar seriously. And, um, but I didn't want an acoustic, you know, I wanted to play model. So I, um, ended up trading that guitar in for, um, I think it was like a Kramer striker model or something. This would mm -hmm. have been about 85 or something like that. And, um, my mom was super pissed off cause she's like, I got you that acoustic as a gift and you traded it. In. I go, but I want an electric guitar. And it's still my gift, but she, uh, I remember she, was pissed about that, but then she understood soon after, like, all right, I get it. So I, I got that, that, that Kramer. And then, um, probably another year or so went by still, um, I got a Kramer and like a PV amp and uh, a backstage plus amp practice amp. And I, mm -hmm would screw around, but same thing. Like I, I wasn't disciplined enough, you know, I wasn't really, and I was never a guy that even to this day that plays stuff by ear. I was never in a cover band or anything, you know? So, um, mm -hmm. I just had a different mindset, but what happened for me, fortunately is, um, in 86, I moved back to Illinois, uh, to live with my dad. And same area, northern rivers of, of Chicago, mm -hmm. and uh, where I was born. And when I got there, I started networking with you know me and friends in high school and all this stuff. And there was this band, um, and this guitar player, uh, the band uh, for Thrash Maniacs, a one who's really old school might know this band. They did one album. This band called uh, Numbskull. And those, yeah. they they put out one this one album, and mm -hmm. um, it was really great. And they were like them and another thrash band that put out another, a number of albums on Enigma Records. Is this thrash band called Wrath? So they were all from mm -hmm. an area called Waukegan, Illinois. And um, uh, so for by the way, for book fans, Ray Bradbury came from Waukegan, Illinois. And uh, oh. um, so did uh, that comedian, Jack Benny. That's Waukegan, oh. uh, part of the Waukegan's Hall of Fame, I guess. But anyway, <laughs> the, 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 these thrash bands that were actually signed and putting out albums at the time while I was in high school, you know, we thought, or I thought, wow, these guys are larger than life. Man, local guys signed, they got albums out, you know, like, wow. So mm -hmm. the guitar, the one the one main, uh, the lead guitar player and the guy who wrote most of the music, this guy, Tom Bradner from Numbskull, was also a guitar teacher um, in my hometown of Libertyville, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And my dad, my dad was really cool uh he got me he got me another electric guitar this time it was a kramer as well but it was like it was like uh i think it was a striker model who was like a randy rhodes copy you know and um uh i'll uh i have a, i'll text you a picture of me with that guitar uh alex because i got yeah. it somewhere here but anyway i started taking lessons from tom bradner and the great thing about Tom was he was everything I could hope for in a guitar teacher because he was one, he was classically trained and mm -hmm. he had a degree in music. So he could play, you know, Paganini and Bach like uh, at a recital, you know, with his fingers and stuff. But he was into all the heaviest metal shit. One, he's in 
a thrash band, Numb Skull, which was great. But like mm -hmm. Slayer, Dark Angel, Metallica, on and on and on. Um, he turned me on to some stuff I had never heard uh, in both metal and with um, just great guitar players. So he turned me on to like Gary Moore and he turned me on to actually Stevie Ray Vaughan and mm -hmm. um, uh, Albert King, all these great blues guys. And Tom is, because of Tom, I learned um, the rudiments of music. So like everyone knows me in Broken Hope as this riff guy. You don't really, I don't really do a lot of leads, but what a lot of people don't know is um, behind the scenes, when I warm up and do stuff at home, like on a shred level or anything, thanks to Tom, that's where I learned to play modes, arpeggios, speed runs. And I do that every day. Like I do all these modes and arpeggios and stuff. And um, he taught me like just some music theory stuff too, you know, the circle of fifths and all kinds of stuff. But I was also getting the techniques of riffing. So he would be like, well, um, what do you like about um, the bridge in Angel of Death? I'm like, well, I like that. He's like, all right, well, this is how you do it. And the technique is, you know, these hammer-ons and he'd tab it out or, you know, just heavy riffs. So I'm learning, you know, hammer-ons in a heavy way, techniques uh, and power chords and bar chords and all this stuff. And um, over time, um, like I had mentioned uh, minutes ago, I was never in a cover band and I never mm -hmm. learned by ear. It, so my trajectory was a, a kid who, um, again, learned all these uh, technical things, even up to a point, I can't do it anymore, of reading music a little bit too. So again, speed runs, modes, arpeggios and stuff, and then mm -hmm. metal guitar techniques on a head, heavy level you know heavy riff level and i just started writing my own music and mm -hmm. um uh i remember and lyrics as well and this before i even had a band and i like would i would write a song on guitar and i'd write lyrics to go with it i was never i've never been a singer but it would be i was like this is like if i had a singer this would fit the chorus and this would fit the verse. And the lyrics were really funny, you know, like I um, was uh, so like anti hair metal and posers and stuff. Um, now I actually appreciate hair metal and some of those. Yeah. Things. And, and, you know, but I, at the time I'm, you know, 16, 17, and that was my attitude. And I, you know, uh -huh. I, Metal Forces magazine and, and write people. And it's yeah. so like my lyrics would either be about, um, like I remember this one song lyrically I wrote, it was like about the, the crossover bridge. You cross the crossover bridge to get away from the posers and to the real <laughs> people on the other side. <laughs> you know? And then another song was called Parasitus. And that was like about like some bum who is in an alley and he finds a rotten piece of meat full of maggots and brings it home and feeds it to his wife. And this parasite grows inside her and bursts out of her, you know, <laughs> shit like that. And nice. I was on my way. And then um, before before long, I um, met this this guy. I went to school with named Joe Thiacek and he became Broken Hope's first singer. And we were, he was into all the same stuff I was. And um, uh, he's also really into uh, punk and hardcore. So he was turning me on to like punk bands I never heard of and stuff. And um, we would jam, we, we, we basically formed our first band together and it was called Decimation. And then, um, I soon found out because of like Metal Forces magazine and stuff 
like all these ads from other bands called Decimation out there and stuff. So um, I did that. Joe and I did that for a little bit. And then we disbanded from the guys we were jamming with. And then um, I'd say it was around 88. Um, we had uh, met this really great drummer named Ryan Stanick. And Ryan was the first guy I ever met in like a teenager who could play fucking like rain and blood songs on drums, you know, like blew me away. I remember um, hearing, you know, all this, this really sick drummers looking to form a band and he wants to meet guitar players. So I, it was kind of like an audition in a way. I went just to see if we'd fit. And I just remember him playing, you know, these just pieces of, you know, Dave Lombardo stuff from Rain of Blood. And I was like, holy shit, this guy's incredible. And I kind of jammed with him. Nothing ever worked out. It wasn't until some months went by um, when I lived with my dad, he had a girlfriend who's now my stepmom and she, he would stay at her house on weekends. So I had my house to myself every weekend. So I would throw parties <laughs> at my house, you know, dad's away you know, the mice will play. So we'd be underage drinking. I'd have like 12 people over and whatnot. And so Joe, Thiacek and I, we were still attached at the hip, still bent on, you know, getting a new band phone and stuff. And one night Ryan Stanick heard about my house party and he came over with this guitar player he was jamming with. And though it was just the, the two of those guys had formed their own band. They didn't have any other band members. They were called Crypt. And um, we're, we're partying at my house, and Joe goes, uh, hey, Jer, dude, break out your guitar, man, and show these guys that new song you wrote, because I had written, you know, one or two new songs. And I go, all right. So I played them, and, like, that's when shit changed. Now, Ryan – you know, when I first met Ryan, I was blown away by him, but he wasn't really impressed with me. And then this time Ryan's like, holy shit, like you can really write killer shit, you know? So you want to jam? So I go, hell yeah. So we, Joe and I went to Ryan's parents' house like the following week and started jamming with him and this other guitar player. And we had, um, and again, we were, they kept the name Crypt, so we were known as Crypt. And then we uh, just jammed with them and things were going great, except we always had a problem with this other guitar player. He um, he had uh, anger management issues and he was really <laughs> bossy. Like, he didn't really write shit. And the stuff he wrote, he was adamant. He had, we had to play his songs, even if we didn't like them and shit like that. And after a while, Joe and I said, you know what? Screw it. You know, there was like one, one day there was a big blow up. And we're like, we're sick of this guy. He's a bully and he's a jerk. And when we, when we packed up, um, packed up my gear, I had a PA by this time that oh, I actually coincidentally bought from Tom Bradner of Numbskull, their old PA, you know, and uh, I took the PA and, um, that Joe sang through and in, in our gear. And um, we had Joe's dad, he had like an SUV, we packed it up and left. And that night, Ryan called us, uh, hey, I, I told this guy, I'm not jamming with him anymore. I want to be with you and Joe, you know, so please uh, come back, but we won't jam with him. And we're like, all right, because we really like Ryan and his drumming and everything. Mm -hmm. So we brought all our shit back like the next week and started jamming. And what we wanted to do was because that other guitar player had dubbed the band Crypt, we didn't want to use his name. Right. So okay. we're like, we got to um, come up, come up with an original name. And uh, I had, um, you know, always been writing lyrics and, and short stories and poems. And I had this name broken hope that came from like some dark 
poem. And what we did was we were, it was Joe Ryan and I sitting on the floor of the jam room in his parents' basement with notebooks, writing down names and stuff. And, um, and thankfully those two guys liked the name Broken Hope. They were like, well, that's not typical, you know, like it's not like dismembered carcass or something. And it's, it's heavy when you hear the name, blah, blah, blah. And, and that's how Broken Hope got the name. And then, um, we, so we kept writing original material. We were now known as Broken Hope, uh, late 1988. Mm -hmm. And then, um, the next year, this is sort of a life changing thing. And this will hit home with you, Alex. That's when I met, uh, Ross Dolan for the first time. Mm -hmm. And what happened was there was, um, if everyone out there knows Milwaukee Metal Fest, there was Milwaukee Metal Fest 3. And I think it was around 89. And it was like death and nuclear assault headlined. So mm -hmm. all the, oh, and, and because of Tom Bradner again, who the more I talk about Tom, the more I'm realizing what an impact the guys had on my life. Yeah, you could tell that just by hearing it. You know, yeah, it's he because he introduced me to this guy who had a fanzine. Uh, this guy, uh, Ed Farshke, he had this fanzine called the, the Rage Book of, of Armageddon. Armageddon. Yeah, uh, Book of Armageddon. Yeah, yeah, uh, Book yep. of Armageddon. Yeah, I'm thinking of his fest, mm -hmm. right? the Book of Armageddon. Uh, yeah. and yep. I remember Tom had told me you got to meet my friend Ed who has this fanzine because you and Ed are the two biggest dark angel fans. I know period. Cause I, I worshiped uh dark angel man and, and, and death too. But I'm so in the dark angel and Ed really fucking worshiped dark angel. So oh, yeah. Ed and I bonded over dark angel. And then that's where I learned to look, started learning more about, the underground, much more so than metal forces, like all these other fanzines and underground band demo bands. And um Milwaukee Metal Fest rolls around and Ed is like, hey, um he called up Tom and me and he's like, I've got a van load of people. We're driving out from New York to Milwaukee. And you know anywhere we can stay? And Tom was like, well, Jerry, your dad's gone on weekends. Why yet could these guys stay there? And I'm like, yeah, and you guys can stay here. So this van, we were all, and then we were going to go to Milwaukee Metal Fest with them. It was like the next day. So they pulled in the day before, and it's like Ed Farsby, um, this other, like, really underground um, I don't know if he did a fan scene or not, but he was really heavily in the underground. This guy named Joe Pupo. I don't know if you know. Yeah. Him. And then um, it was, um, uh, I think John McEntee was with them. And I think uh, one of these guys, um, remember the band Apparition? Yeah, Brett. And, uh, yeah. Mike. So like one or two it's of those guys were in this van. Um, and, and Ross was with them and, uh, Ross had a mustache back then and, yeah. um, and some other people. So these guys all stayed at, at my house and we were all partying and, um, uh, they all gave me demos of their bands and, and Ross said, they just had that, um, second demo out and he gave me mm -hmm. that, he gave me that that white t-shirt with the, the, the demo. Right on. On it. Yeah. And, um, he, him and I just hit it off right away. Like we, we've been friends like ever, ever since. And, um, same with Ed Farshke and, um, mm -hmm. and, and I, you know, uh, all, you know, some of the other guys, but anyway, um, we, so I, we went to metal fest mm -hmm. together the next day. Oh, they turned me on to uh, 
Morbid Angel, who quickly became my new favorite band then, you know, and the, and this is just before um, Alters of Madness was coming out. So right. 89 and mm -hmm. uh, uh, so that that 89, a lot of stuff influenced and changed me um, because uh, well, I'll get to it later about when I went to New York and, and, and stuff there with uh, Ed Farshti and these guys. But back to Metal Fest in 89, Ross and I kept in touch and um, I ended up going to New York um, to see, um, so it's like now it's around, uh, it's around 1990 now because I think Mount Milwaukee Metal Fest was winter. 1990 rolls around. I go to um, New York to see two shows in one night. One, I went to Lemoore's. We, um, I think Tom Brad, it was just Tom Bradner and I. We drove my my shit box Renault Alliance from the suburbs of Chicago to New to New York. And um, we, oh, we stayed at Joe Pupo's house and we went to see, um, uh, who, who, oh, Overkill and Dark Angel and a little local band was opening called Biohazard. And it was at Lamar. Oh, yeah. Wow. And, um, and that same night on Long Island at, um, I think it was called Alex, you probably correct me if I'm it's Sundance. Oh, Sundance. Yeah. Long Island. It yeah. came to Roxy. I think that, yeah. So at the Sundance was, um, uh, death. I think they're on spiritual healing tour. It was like death and devastation. Devastation. Yes. On combat and apparition open. And, oh, yeah. and when I was at that show, um, it was crazy because, again, these shows were happening the same night. So we went from one to the other, like Long Island, from, you know, from Brooklyn to Long Island or Long Island to Brooklyn, whatever. Um, and um, at that at that death show that night, like uh, the Immolation guys were there, um, Suffocation guys, I'd never heard of mm -hmm. them before. Mm -hmm. And this was before, I think, maybe even before maybe before Josh Barron, the, the bass player was at, this guy I met, I thought, I think he was the bass player at the time. He, he might've been, Josh. it might've been a different, yeah. but he had a suffocation fucking business card. Yeah. I still yeah. have it to this day. You get, hey, I'm in I was Josh because he gave me a team. Oh, oh, <laughs> it might be a different guy, but so yeah, I that's funny. Business card, so I'm hanging with, you know, <laughs> Fledgling immolation guys and fledgling suffocation guys and broken hope was broken hope. It was it was a thing. And we were all like the same age and um and, and right after that I'm like, hey Ross, we're going in the studio to record our first demo and whatnot. He goes, all right, let me know when you do. I want you to send it to me right away and uh, um. I want to check it out. So I did that. And Ross is so fucking cool, man. He and, and Ed Farshi too. Like um, they both had sent me lists of all these fanzines to send demos to. And um, mm -hmm. I save everything. I probably still had that letter from Ross that was a whole page of zine names and addresses from around the world. He said, send your demo to all these guys and tell them I sent you. And, and then, and with that, I had, um, the, you know, the flyers from all these other demo bands, like you pack in an envelope and stuff. And that's what I did. The demo came out. I sent it everywhere. And I was, I had been lightly tape trading before then, but when our demo came out, I was really heavily tape trading all over. And that's what got, the, the the broken hope name out there and then um not long after that this is just relevant to new york and morbid angel i wanted to mention um i had heard um 
like uh, whatever their demo or maybe their whatever, uh, what was it, abominations. I heard something, Joe Pupo and it was that or someone else say, one, they, they had these like truck, morbid angel truck caps they fucking wore all the time. And uh, again, they turned me on to morbid angel, but I went to this cool fest in Buffalo, New York. Again, long road trip, herbs of Chicago up the up the Buffalo. And what was cool, Tom Bradner joined me again, and Tom actually had family in Buffalo, so we stayed at his grandparents' house, and we mm -hmm. went to this festival um, called. Oh, let me back up a second. Sorry, that trip I took where I saw, you know. Um, death and devastation and overkill and dark angel um mm -hmm. that during that trip we went to fucking really awesome record store slip disc records in valley stream new york <laughs> and yep. i bought alters of madness again this is around 89 or 90 early 90 i don't know but i bought um alters of madness and at the same time terrorizer world downfall Two albums that fucking changed my life just as much as Ride the Lightning changed my mm -hmm. life. And um, and they were imports back then. They weren't distributed in the US yet. So like they were really expensive. But I I bought them. I had saved my pennies for the trip. We went to that record store, man, and I was like, went home with those two albums, and I'm like, holy shit. And it was like not just one album became my favorite. I had two albums. Like neck and neck, uh, Morbid Angel, Alters of Madness, and Terrorizer World Downfall. I was like, holy fuck, my head's gonna explode. This shit's fucking amazing. Yo, yo, just fucking awesome. So, that said, not to bore your viewers, but I returned to, back, well, as I was saying, Buffalo, New York, for a festival called Day of Death, I think. And it was Morbid Angel, Ripping Corpse. Immolation, Revenant, and local Buffalo band Baphomet. And mm -hmm. um, Tom and I got up there. We stayed at his grandparents' house, met up with Ed Farshti and these guys. And they had access, uh, you know, uh, guestless shit. And we, you know, were there all day, like from Morbid Angel loading in and, and stuff. And, um, and, and so this is my first time seeing Morbid Angel uh, live. And um, like, uh, you know, I was all like intimidated by Morbid Angel. Like even when they're loaded in, you know, David Vincent is dressed from head to toe like he's on stage, you know, with his boots and shit. And I'm like, you're like, uh, wow, he looks uh, scary, you know. <laughs> and, and, and like Trey, I'll never forget Trey, was, they're doing sound check and I'm standing on the side of the stage like with Ed and Joe Pupo and Tom and, and stuff. And I remember Trey saying, like, at, in between a song or a sound check, and he, like, turned to us. He's like, do you hear that? I'm like, hear what? He's like, the demons. The demons <laughs> come out of, they come out of my cabinet. I'm like, cool. Can you put them back, please, for just a second? <laughs> yeah, he told me. <laughs> and, and I was like, so anyway, that show was fucking awesome, man. Every band just, I had either albums or demos from, you know, about that whole lineup. Um, Ripping Corpse were just fucking great. Eric Rutan, you know, I met him for the first time then. Yeah. And um, that's where I got my first shout out for Broken Hope from a stage ever, because of Ross, because our demo mm -hmm. does come out. And he's like, this next song, is uh for Jeremy Wagner Broken Hope. And uh, I was like, holy shit, wow, someone mentioned my band name from stage, you know. I was on my fucking floor and all that, you know. So um anyway, great show. Oh, and a funny also little just thing was I remember during load in at that day of death when we were just hanging loose, this van pulled up in these guys came out and uh someone goes oh that oh i remember that this like security guard is 
he's like at the back loading door with some other security guy. And he's like, Hey, look who it is. And he's like, hey, those guys know not to fucking come here. And it, it was a uh, cannibal corpse. Oh. From the Buffalo. And what I found out later, cause I asked Chris Barnes about this years later ago, you know, I saw a cannibal corpse pull up to, um, that that venue, the um, I think it's called the Sky Room. Sky Room, yeah. yeah. Yep. And I go, I, I remember you guys pulled up in a van. I didn't get to actually meet you, but you you guys knew Morbid Angel, and you came up to say hi. And David was out talking to you, but I remember these security guys said, "Oh, it's fucking Campbell Corpse. They they know not to come in here." Blah blah blah. And Chris is like, "Yeah, we." Um, they open like when Cannibal Corpse local band in Buffalo at the time, they, they opened up a, a, a show where they um, basically got in a fight or something with the headlining band or, did, you know, mm -hmm. the headlining band did something to, to them or made, or their girlfriends or something. So Chris Barnes, who, really hasn't changed. He's not a shy guy. Tell you what he thinks. I guess he said something about the headlining band from stage and that started this big tiff, you know, in their hometown at the venue. So like the, the, the venue had a problem with, you know, cannibal corpse because of it, but just a little trivia for y'all right there. <laughs> I technically was, you know, within whatever, you know, six or seven degrees of, you know, Cannibal Corpse, Morbid Angel, Immolation, Revenant, on and on. Mm -hmm. Right. Pretty fucking cool, you know. So nice. uh, anyway, um, we just started doing more and more shows as Broken Hope, and we were getting on on festivals and stuff, and um, we 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 did a death metal fest in Waukesha, Wisconsin. And I actually got um, the promoter, Eric Reif, who managed the band Death for years, put that show on. And he had like uh, Atheist and Cynic on there and uh, a bunch of bands. And I remember telling Eric, hey, would you put on um, Immolation and Revenant? Um, they're really cool guys and fucking they're great, blah, blah, blah. And, and he, he got them on that fest and then we did a fest after that <clears throat> in milwaukee um which was it was basically part of a tour package but eric Greif promoted and turned it into a festival and it was like uh it was the sepultura obituary sadist tour and so it was like cause of death and uh sadist's first album cause of death by obituary and uh Beneath the Remains era, uh, Sepultura. So I also got Immolation on that one too. So, um, you know, Immolation in me, especially Ross and Bob, you know, just been super tight since we were basically teenagers, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, our, I was still tape trading and whatnot. And then um, we had written mm -hmm. it original material after that demo where we started well i was shopping that demo around and um it it got us traction and we actually we got ended up getting a, a deal with this label called grindcore international and that's how our first album was released swamped in gore and mm -hmm. that album came out and um Thanks to all that old school tape trading, like back, like nowadays, like, I don't know, you, if you sell 5,000 copies, I think you're doing pretty good. We sold like 10,000 copies of Swamp Ding Gore and went into a second pressing. And that's when Metal Blade took notice of us. So I um, sent, at the time, Marco Barbieri was the a &R guy at Metal Blade. And we had just finished uh, a second demo, basically. And what I mean by that is we we had our first demo that we traded. We got a record deal, had swamped out. 
and we demoed four songs with for labels only basically because we wanted to get out of this grindcore deal and metal blade um loved that the new shit and basically signed us got the rights to swamp the gore re-released it and then we basically spent the 90s putting out we put out five albums and toured our asses off and you know uh that's what what we did and then there was a 10-year hiatus <laughs> after grotesque blessings our fifth album we did um tours did north america europe and some other stuff and then um things in, in, internally by then like even that lineup uh on the fifth album ryan stanick was gone by then sean glass was gone and we basically had hired guns it was like joe brian griffin our longtime guitar player and me and um and right when i well i should back up a minute we did the album we had hired guns on that album filling in on drums and bass um but shortly after the album came out joe left the band he didn't want to tour anymore or anything so we did these mm -hmm. tours now is this like brian griffin and i were the only original guys from the vintage broken hope era and it was just like a revolving door of, of other people and it was just like uh, i want to put the brakes on this because for me being in a band i want it might sound corny but people say music's a business uh, blah 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 but like i want camaraderie and chemistry among members it wasn't like that anymore you know and so we put the brakes on and i didn't think we'd be gone that long but that's just what happened and during that time is when i started what was going to be a full-time project that kept getting put to the side put to the side which was earth burner which was going to be my not the terrorizer roll downfall kind of vibe you know and um i ended up forming this other band called lupara we did one album and a music video um back in, i think that was like 2007 and then um try and give you a reader's digest version because it's a lot of freaking years but 2011 <laughs> I was gonna bring earth burner back and that's how i met our current drummer mike meachek who's been jamming with me since 2011 we were going to do earth burner and we actually did a three song ep uh with a singer named ryan richards and we did a music video and then like you got to understand during the time broken hope was on hiatus people were always like bring broken hope back from fans to promoters all around the world and uh you know and that always um made me feel bad because like i'm like i want to fucking bring broken hope back but like there was a period i wasn't talking to joe and um you know uh, brian griffin um was had made this incredible career for himself as a sound man and tour manager and he's like now lamb of god's main front of house and tour manager he mm -hmm. uh, didn't really want to do a band again and stuff so i i, I was just always like i gotta have the right lineup and stuff and what happened in 2011 i was already jamming with mike who was such a sick drummer we're doing earth for, me, for fun we would play all these broken hope songs just him and me for fun and it felt really good and then just kind of like right place right time thing for things to happen where we got approached by this company that was a man, one part management company one part booking agency under one roof and they said there's a demand for broken hope out there we've seen it for years we can help you get that lineup you want and make it happen and i'm like all right i'm i'm down so i put earth burner again to the side and what we did was it was mike and i were already in place talked to sean glass who was in broken hope for a couple years in the 90s and he came back and i 
I did hit up Brian Griffin and he's like, man, I, I'm busy with my, you know, career as a song man and tour manager. <laughs> and he was great. He couldn't have been more supportive though. He goes, Jared, fucking broken hope is your baby, you know, and mm -hmm. you just can't wait to hear your new shit. Whenever it comes out, go for it. So um, Sean's the one who got us a, a second guitar player. And then when we were looking, we had to find the right vocalist, <clears throat> someone that unfortunately Joe Thychek died in 2010. So he wasn't mm -hmm. coming back. And um, oh, and Ryan Stanek, um, who's who unfortunately passed away, his anniversary of his death was actually yesterday. He's been mm -hmm. gone three years. Um, Ryan was wasn't really even playing drums anymore. He was like became this like singer songwriter kind of guy. So he wasn't coming back. But um, Mike and I again we were together a solid unit, and so we got Sean and we got this other guitar player, and then we're like who who can sit deliver vocals like Joe? Because one thing broken hope. Is always known for were these super guttural vocals, and um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm like not. I'm saying this unbiased, and not just because Joe is my friend and he's gone, but Joe's, in my opinion, one of the sickest vocalists that ever lived. And he, since we were teenagers, he was his whole mission was always to be. The sickest death metal vocalist, and he would he worked on being as guttural as possible and really just fucking delivering, and that was super important, you know. Like you got to have the right right person, and yeah. we talked to a number of vocalists. Um, I even hit up uh, um, John Gallagher from Dying Fetus, who I'm friends with, and um, other people. Like, hey, would you, you know, because I didn't know if Broken Hope would like come back full time, but we figured, hey, maybe we'll do an album and some festival days. Yeah. So I hit up Gallagher and other guys. And um, one of the people on our list was Damian Lesky from Gorgasm. And um, it just was like, it fell into place perfectly because Damian at the time lived in Indiana. He wasn't far away from our Chicago headquarters. And he lives mm -hmm. in Chicago now. Um, he had gutturals like no one else. He really, like, it sounds funny, but like Damien works on his craft. He works on the craft of being a sick vocalist, like he practices in his car or wherever he can, like he takes it so seriously. And he wanted to do right by Joe's legacy and the fans and mm -hmm. that attitude and his abilities and the chemistry fucking just worked. And so by the end of 2011, early 2012, Broken Hope lineup was in place. And we announced our return with a direct support tour with Obituary uh, called Carnival of Death Tour. And mm -hmm. that was a great tour. And during that tour, we got signed with Century Media Records. And in 2013, our comeback album, Omen of Disease, came out. And been doing Broken Hope ever since. Um, our last album, Mutilated and Assimilated, came out a while ago. It's like time to do a new album. That was like 2017. Um, but we're still very active. Like this year, we're headlining a stage at Maryland Death Fest. We're doing Party Sand Open Air in Germany, Brutal Salt. We have a new album written uh, we mm -hmm. just to record it. I got to finish lyrics, but this some like this summer, I would like to uh, at least get the music recorded for the new Broken Hope album. So uh, people always ask, when the hell are you going to release an album? Like clock's ticking. We want new Broken Hope, the handful of fans we have. And <laughs> we are, we have an album written, um, but uh Bringing you guys up to speed now, it's worth mentioning that other band I wanted to do that kept getting pushed aside, Earthburner, mm -hmm. actually 
have recorded a full length earth burner album. We have a solid lineup. It's Mike mm-hmm. Meechek from Broken Hope on drums and me on guitar. Mm-hmm. My stepson Tyler is on bass. Tyler's in a grind core. He loves grind core death metal. He's mm-hmm. 29 and you'd think he's been like an old soul, like, like us, you know, yeah, yeah. 53 and he's like into old school death metal. Ryan he's also got his finger on the pulse of all this, the new wave of extreme metal. He's always turning me on the bands. Anyway, he's in a grind band called Glory Hole Guillotine. And what's funny is I have Tyler to thank for Earthburner coming back because you guys, you know, the band sang with Sugabog. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, right? yeah, you did, right? yeah, of course. Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. Uh, Devin from Sanguasuga Bog is a huge Broken Hope fan. And I remember Tyler going to see bands. Uh, he's like, this was a few years back. He's like, I'm gonna I'm going to Ohio to see a, a garage show. I go, garage right. show. These bands are doing a, a concert in a garage in Columbus, Ohio, or something. And it was like wow, Sanguasuga Bog, maybe 200 wow. Wounds, who both bands are now like all over the place, and you know the guy. Yeah. But he 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 knew about those guys way back then, and um, I ended up meeting Devin, and then um, yeah, as time went on, um, like last year, shit, it's been probably a year this month, March of last year, Devin. Mm-hmm. And I would text here and there, but Devin talked to Tyler a lot. And Devin hit Tyler up and said, what is your stepdad Jeremy doing with Earthburner? And Tyler's like, he always talks about wanting to do, he's got albums worth of material for Earthburner and someday hopes to do it. He's like, well, I, I really want to do a grind project. I'd love to sing for Earthburner. Tyler tells me that. And that just lit a fire under my ass. I'm like, you know what? If I'm gonna fucking do Earth Burner, now's the time. Because I have Devin, Devin from saying the Sugabod wants to sing, and I've got Mike and I already in an albums with the material. And I swear within a week of confirming really Devin, you really want to do it. Yep. I booked studio time and we went in last April and recorded. Uh, all the music for the Earthburner album. <clears throat> we did the vocals in July. And what's cool is um, I had reached out to Mitch Harris of Napalm Death, and him and I are longtime friends. I always liked his screaming kind of vocals he do with Napalm Death. I'm like, dude, mm-hmm. can you do a song as a guest vocalist on this Earthburner album? He goes, Absolutely. So I sent him the music. Yeah. And when we did the vocals, because Devin couldn't do his vocals back in last April because he was on tour so mm-hmm. much. That's why we did them in July in Chicago. And I flew Mitch out to do guest vocals on a song. Well, Mitch came in the studio and says, and comes to the table saying, I've actually got ideas for all the fucking songs. So I'm like, all right, do something on every song. And it worked out so good. Like, I love the Earthburner album, everything we're doing, but having that layer of Mitch Harris just kicked it off. So he's like, he's like an honorary member of the band. And we're playing our first Earthburner show in Chicago on March 30th this month. So Mm -hmm. Mitch is going to join us and he'll be on stage with Devin singing every song. And it it just. And then, and so on our, on this Wednesday, our official uh, press release comes out. We had one press release announcing the band, but this Wednesday where is the announcement of the label we signed to the name of the album, the track listing, and also our first radio single. So people will be able to hear earth burner and our, our 3d animated video for that same radio signal that's all coming out Wednesday wow. and then at, oh. again, and then at the end of the month is our, our first show but the album also features um my dear dear brother Ross Stolen did guest, guest vocals on 
the first track called Necrodisiac. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, we did a cover. There's um, back when I was telling you all about like um, my evolution of, you know, getting into heavier and heavier music. So like outside of 1984 change in my life, 1986 was a life changing year. Cause I was, you know, master of puppets came out and rain and blood. And, um, yeah. um, I think darkness of sons came out that year. Um, yeah. And, and, but I did the other stuff and one album that I loved back then when I was 16, was the album Animosity by Corrosion of Conformity. Yeah, and, yeah my, it's my favorite. And there's a song called Positive Outlook that, um, like, maybe you guys can relate. Have you ever heard, like, a piece of music that's from a different genre, but there's something in the music when you hear it, you're like, man, if I played that through my guitar and my rig in tone, that yeah. would be Thick as fuck, right? So positive <laughs> was a heavy song, to it was, but it was more, you know, punky and loose and stuff. But there's a sure. bridge, bridge end part of that song was, was so fucking heavy, man. I'm like, if I like, like I said, I was never a cover guy. You know, we did one cover. It's broken old Captain Howdy by Twisted Sister on our third album. Is Joe? <laughs> yeah. Joe was a huge Twisted Sister fan. And uh, that we fucking cover that song. So we did that. But outside of that, again, not much of a covers guy. But in my head, I was like, I want to I wanna cover Positive Outlook because I know if I play it through this rig, it'll be just fucking crushing. So we actually, Earthburner was the perfect vehicle to do that cover. So we the, the bonus track or the last track is that COC cover a positive outlook. And on that, um, we have Mitch Harris and then this other vocalist who's really fucking great named Jay Cannavale. He lives in New York. I think he lives in Brooklyn. Um, Mm -hmm. Cannavale is in a grindcore band called Vixen Maw. And, but he's also an actor. He's been in a bunch of TV shows and stuff. And, um, his dad, um, is a buddy of mine too. who I love, uh, Bobby Cannavale. You know that actor, he's really well known. He's one of my favorite actors. Super cool, awesome dude. I, lo- I love Bobby and 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 Jake. So Jake, I extended the invite to him because I just he's like my stepson's age, into the same music. He's got a grindcore band too. And I'm like, hey man, you want to do guest vocals on this COC cover? So we did it. So Nice. We've got some great guest vocalists on the Earth. Program. Yeah, sounds like it. This Wednesday, everyone will uh, see and hear, you know, a bit about what we're about. So I'm really excited about. Yeah, that. I can't wait to hear it, man. Yeah. Um, before we get into the guitars, I, I kind of wanted to ask you a little bit about, yeah, you know, Chicago metal scene, and uh, you know, when I got into um, the tape trading scene, I guess it was probably about '86. Mm-hmm. There was a lot of these music I was discovered like bands that were like even more extreme than you know say creator or whatever at the time yeah. starting to got that less extreme you know than they were in the past so I discovered band like obviously trouble was like probably the first introduction into the Chicago metal scene oh, yeah uh, yeah I heard like devastation uh master you know all these bands and we you know at back in those days that did that you know, that scene have any effect on you at all? Like some of those bands, you know, that were in the underground metal scene in Chicago? It was um, not so much maybe an influence, um, but a, like an appreciation. Cause I, Mm -hmm. going from thrash, kind of like what you're saying, going from like creator to master, say, you know, um, on a local on a local band level and a personal taste level, I also was going from thrash into more uh, extreme bands. And back to my guitar teacher, Tom Bradner, he's the first guy to ever turn me on to master. He's like, Hey, there's this guy, uh, Paul Speckman. He's from Chicago. He's got, uh, 
he he was just putting out albums out through nuclear blast when nuclear blast started. So Tom Bradner had CDs of uh, Master and Abomination, and yep. I can't remember um, what else Paul did, but um, I was like, wow, like that shit's really fat. Like you know, I was like, I'm a thrash head getting into some death metal, but hadn't heard anything like that. And then at the same time, Tom was like, well, if you dig master, check out repulsion. And then it was like that kind of thing. And that was like, you know, as much as the world hears me, you know, sing the praises of, of terrorizer, um, in the grand scheme of hearing anything that's considered grind or early grind, those bands definitely were so powerful and, and grinding that like I hadn't heard that style before. Um, yeah. But they just, for whatever reason, didn't have that impact that Terrorizer did. But what's funny yeah. about Terrorizer is on there, because I know the album inside and out, <laughs> I'm a fucking terrorizer, yeah. world downfall free. <laughs> like they they think master and repulsion and shit. So like, so like I take took that seriously. Just reading the liner notes, going oh, sure. revisit that stuff that Tom turned me on to way back because mm -hmm. that's my favorite band's influences, you know. And yeah. um, the only other band um, that. Um, when you talk about introduction to like Chicago metal, me being from the Chicago land area, the Burbs, um, as I had mentioned, the local heroes where I was from were Numbskull and Raph. And mm -hmm. oh, yeah. I learned about, um, about um, Master and Abomination um, and Trouble, of course, but a band, the band um, Syndrome, Syndrome, yeah. John Glass came from when he joined Broken Hope. And mm -hmm. um, I would see, like, um, same thing, like liner notes of other bands giving a shout out, like, uh, even uh, years later, like, even Barney of Napalm Death giving a nod to Troy Dixler from Syndrome because of that vocal style, you know? Yeah. And um, Syndrome were probably out of all the Chicagoland bands, the biggest like underground tape trading band I'd ever seen. Yeah, they were, they were really popular. They were really, yeah. really next level, you know, and, uh, mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah. So um, again, to kind of answer your question, um, there weren't, there weren't a, a bunch of Chicago bands that influenced me so much as, enlighten me but right if there's ever an influence i i'd have to go back to uh numbskull and tom bradner and even not so much their first album the for the numbskull demo called numbs the word had such an impact mm -hmm. on me as a young fledgling guitar player get just beginning to take lessons from tom bradner that was a really mm -hmm. It was like a crazy, like it was like an album basically. It was like a 10 track demo. And yeah, I, I had that demo. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, I, you know, it's, it's crazy. All I've never known all these years that he, he gave you lessons. That's super cool. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I knew that. Wow. Very cool, man. The best That's awesome. teacher I ever had in my life. And just mm -hmm. um, the perfect one for me, really, for what I was seeking. And again, both, uh, as far as tech, technical skills and riffing skills, like Tom had it all. I couldn't have been luckier, man. You know? Yeah. That's all. Awesome. Yeah. So I guess we'll get to uh, the guitars and, um, and uh, you know, we're both, we're both ESP guys, you know, we know that, yeah. but I know you're, you're a collector too. You, you know, you, besides ESP, you have a lot of stuff, but is there anything, I guess, like is, I, you know, I, I pretty you, we discussed this earlier on. You're you're one humbucker guy. And, uh, is yeah. there a reason behind that? You know that that's like that's become your thing. 
Yeah, I think it's because, um, like, um, one, well, one thing to be clear, make clear is like, um, when it, like, when I'm in Broken Hope and Earth Burner, I'm just like, I'm all about being a riff machine. I just fucking want to lay down the heaviest riffs and whatnot, right? And, and then, in, in my personal life, I uh, practice molds and arpeggios and speed runs, but <laughs> I, I appreciate a single coil pickup when I'm doing some of that fun shred stuff at home, right? But yeah, yeah. for the most part, I'm like a one humbucker guy, you know? So like, um, I'll, I'll show you this, this guitar with, this is on the subject of earth burner real quick. With earth mm -hmm. burner, when I, when I formed Earthburner, um, I intentionally wanted to tune down. So Broken Hope has always been a D standard tuning. Mm -hmm. And um, with Earthburner, I wanted to tune down to B. So wow. um, ESP made me these custom baritone uh, ESP guitars tuned to B. And, um, when, but the, the funny thing about those baritones, which I love, um, I actually didn't use them in the studio when we did the earth burner album. Cause in one part, things happened so fast with earth burner from the minute Devin Swank said, I want to do earth burner. And I already had an album's worth of material. And I was I'm down in Miami Beach right now, so I do the mm -hmm. snow thing. Winter rolls around. I'm out of Chicago by November 1st in Miami Beach till like June 1st, and then back to Chicago. It's just it, it sounds climate. horrible, by the way. It, it, it's Roger, tough. Roger, I was born in the wrong climate. I, <laughs> right, and me too. I don't, like, I don't like being cold. So <laughs> the guitars, I so like those custom baritones. And a lot of guitars I have in the, what I call uh, my primary guitar vault. That's all up in Chicago area. Down here, I've got a number of guitars, and they're great. So I got this ESP um, that this again. This is going back to Earthburner. Devin Swank saying I want to do Earthburner. I've got albums worth of material. I wasn't going to fly to Chicago to grab a baritone. So I got the, I had this guitar here. What this is, is a ESP LTD. It's called, the, it's called the black model model. I don't yeah, yeah. yeah so Bob has that one. It's yeah. like a satin, uh, satin finish. Yeah. And it's got one, one humbucker, you know, and I use this to um, basically track the Earthburner album. And the other thing is like, um, I guess if I wasn't in such a hurry and logistically, you know, challenged, I, I would have grabbed one of the, my custom baritones to track the earth for album. Cause I'm also like, uh, Alex, you know, and people out there know I'm, I'm like a, a ESP loyalist, you know, and I, um, I'm also like an EMG loyalist and this, this is a, a Seymour Duncan. I don't know if it's a super, I don't even know if it's a super distortion oh, or anything. Yeah, I know. Dark winter. Isn't it? It, it, I tuned it to B and played it through um, a diesel D mall amp that I have here. And the tone was so fucking heavy that I'm like, shit, I, I didn't worry anymore about not getting one of my earth burner baritone guitars you know this thing yeah. did the trick and i actually so this is what i even um with earth burners first show come out march 30th what i do here is i rehearse in my studio and i play along to the earth burner album start to finish like i, I do it like two times in a row and i use this thing so um when we play live, though, I will be using one of my custom baritones, but just on a guitar geek level, this is like 
kind of in a way an official earth burner guitar because it is yeah. on the album and it's what i used to rehearse with you know that's so, awesome man yeah, yeah you know like me, that guitar right there that ltd black metal um when uh when we did the last simulation record me and bob bought up some different guitars you know and he has that one the ltd black metal the m1 mm -hmm. i guess that's what that is and uh he had, you know, regular ESP, and then he had the LTD, and then he was like, I'm liking the LTD better. And uh, he actually used, for his, for his rhythm tracks, he used that same model, which is kind of funny. Oh, wow. That's yeah. really cool. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I have a funny, real quick, funny story to share with you guys and your viewers. Alex, you might even know this story, but um, it just cracks me up. It, it's a story that Ross and Bob told me. When they were recording Donna Possession with uh, Harris Johns, the pretty, is that right? Yeah, Harris yeah. Johns. Um, they flew to Germany and they're in the studio and, you know, they're on Roadrunner, everything. It's Harris Johns, you know, like a real producer and fucking legend. Yeah. And, um, serious business. And these guys are young and they're, you know, got their gear in and they're, going to start tracking and the way the story goes i think i got it right that ross and bob told me is that harris johns said um all right guys um we're gonna begin tracking or whatever blah 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 but what are you tuned to and they looked at each other and one of ross or bob said oh uh, Ross, i think it was ross said uh yeah. we tuned to bob yeah, that's true. <laughs> stand or, or B or, or drop D or a. it was a. Um, yeah, yeah. We, was like, you're a B. We tuned, that's where you're at. We tuned the Bob. <laughs> that just killed me. That's me up, man. That's so the thing. That's the truth. Back that back in those days, you know, all of us we didn't know what the hell we were doing. We're just like, I don't know. We're just... Yeah, yeah, same with me. Same with me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's yeah. awesome. When I started, yeah. I thought like just everybody in the world was tuned the E standard. Yeah. When I was like, tuning, like, so, yeah. yeah. God, I, it's almost a rarity I see anybody yeah. coming here tuned to E anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Everything. I don't know anyone that down. tunes to E. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? So is there any is there any guitar that's like kind of out of all the you know out of your arsenal where this is like. You, is the number one that's just kind of like that has that mojo that you always go back to? Yeah, there's um, I wish I had it here, but it, it's up north. But I have uh, an ESP custom that's my primary like Broken Hope guitar, and mm -hmm. um, it's um, got these. It, if you're, it, I don't know, if you Google like. Jeremy Wagner guitar or something, ESP. It's like got these great graphics by, uh, for one, Bob Tyrell, who actually did all the, my whole sleeve here. He's a mm -hmm. really tattoo mm -hmm. guy. I asked him to do the graphics for that guitar. Um, that really stands out um, as far as, as a aesthetic, but the, the build on that guitar it's like, Alex, when you talk about mojo, like the the feel of, of that guitar, I'm talking about everything from the, the weight to the, the body shape to the neck. It's like, it's like, sounds corny, but it, that guitar is the one guitar out of all my guitars that feels like it's just like another limb. It's an extension of my mm. body. There's something about it. It was made to my specs and everything, just like other customs I have that are made to my specs. But I don't know what to say other than that thing is like super magic. You know, it might mm -hmm. it might be akin to what like Greeny, the famous Gibson Les Paul was to um, yeah. Like uh, Kirk, Kirk yeah, right, 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 or Barry Moore, 
or mm-hmm. you know, Stevie Ray Vaughan strap. You know, it's like that's what that is for me. There's just something about the feel, the the tone as well. Um, it's just really, I don't know, man. It's really that one's really special to me. You know. I think- Maybe you let me check that guitar out. Maybe in Japan is that the one with the Cthulhu oh, or something? Did yeah, I play that guitar? You, I think I did. You did check that one out. In, in, in yeah, the- yeah, yeah. That's a that's a beautiful guitar. And um, I just yeah, I just I love that one. That one's really yeah. for me really really special. And um, mm-hmm. a real quick uh, ESP story, and I wanted to show you guys something. Is when back when I told you that. I um, had Kramer's as my first guitars. The guitar store I got my Kramer's from, from that town I lived in, Stevens Point, Wisconsin, they were the first, that was the first store I ever saw that carried ESP guitars. Mm -hmm. And the Mm -hmm. ESP guitars, this is from that that year, probably when I was a teenager. This is a vintage uh, ESP, this turquoise one. This is a Horizon. Oh, and beautiful. Oh, yeah. What's cool is there's no inlays on it, which I... Yeah, yeah, nice. But they had that Jackson-style headstock. Yeah. That there was a lawsuit over back in the 80s. Jackson's like, hey, you ripped off our headstock, and that's when ESP changed it. But these old vintage mm-hmm. ESPs with the Jackson-style headstock um, are so well-built, and like like this, I could I could take this and tour with it right now and play, mm-hmm. and play with it. I like the body style on that. The shaping is cool. Yeah. Yeah. The contours are just so really cool. It's just, it, it's awesome. And the thing I want to tell you about the guitar, about ESP and going down memory lane is when I first saw ESPs in that music store um, were, they looked just like this. They're like, in my opinion, like the most gorgeous guitar to me. Like I have a yeah, yeah. I like I like this kind of body style. I like having yeah. fretboards, things like that. The right. things like that are appealing to me. What I want in a, a guitar, but you know, um, I was really poor, and these were fucking expensive back then. Like you know, like. I was like, I can't afford nine hundred dollar guitar. Somewhere over a yeah. thousand, you know. And yeah, yeah. Um, it wasn't until, um, like, right around Broken Hope when we formed. I had um, <clears throat> right after I graduated high school, I had like my first full time job, and I worked on a golf course. Uh, on the grounds. So I'd be up at like four in the morning and working on a golf course by five and off by two. And I saved all my money that summer, like 1988, to buy my first ESP, which was an M2. So even an M2 was expensive for me to save up for. A Horizon, um, forget about it. I'm like, I need to work two summers to buy one of these, you know. So, um, so when I get um, uh, a vintage GSP like that, it's like I don't know. Um, one part me being almost sentimental, like the seventeen-year-old kid in me right. is really happy to have fucking one of these ESPs that he drooled over and yeah, you know, yeah. and. But they're just again built so great, and I fucking love them. And this is what got me into ESP. And related to ESP, um, when I got my first one, Tom Bradner, who I mentioned um, from Numbskull, who was my guitar teacher, by by 1988 he was teaching at two different music stores. So. There was a music store in a town called Kenosha, Wisconsin, that was an ESP dealer. And that's where I got my my M2 ESP. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. because of Tom working at a music store, he got uh, NAM badges. 
And Nam used to be in Chicago at a place at a uh, like an expo center called uh, McCormick Place. And mm-hmm. I went to my first ever Nam show uh, around 18 or so, a teenager. And I actually met uh, Matt Massey and Darrell, the president of VSP. Um, mm-hmm. Well, technically, I take that back. Technically, I just remember this. Um, do you guys know, uh, Roger, are you from New York? No, no, I'm from DC. Okay. There's Alex, you might, uh, maybe, you know, this Roger, but there was a street like 48th street in New York. Yeah. That all yeah, the it's right above 47th yeah. is all I know. So 48th street, there was a 48th street guitar shop. That's where ESP first started actually. Oh. And we, what, having yep. an office and some kind the of US. and Matt Massey and Darrow, he in his career was a tour manager. He had he had been a tour manager for Motorhead, and he was a guitar tech guy for for uh, Dokken, and that's like him and George Lynch. Just they are basically right. family, and it was through George Lynch, early ESP guy, that Matt, I believe, met the owner of ESP and said, Hey, how would you like to work for ESP? And basically Matt's the main dude who got things started for ESP in North America. So I technically, when I went to New York for those concerts, I told you about like the death and dark angel, yeah. overkill, Tom yeah. Brad was with me and he's like, Hey, uh, my boss is at the, at the music store in Kenosha, Wisconsin. He's friends with Matt. Massey and Darrow, the main dude at ESP. Let's go see him. So I met actually met Matt then, and I I think I still have his business card. But then later that year or whatever was a Nam show in Chicago, and ESP had a booth and, and stuff. So right. that's kind of how far back I technically go with Matt and ESP mm-hmm. you know, since I was a, a teenager, and then when Broken Hope was signed and really swamped and gore um like some eager beaver uh you know musicians i wanted a guitar endorsement and i you know sent matt our album and you know said i all i play are esps and i worship esp and blah 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 and he's always treated me great yeah man. yeah That's he's, treated, awesome. he's treated me like yeah. he's got Kirk and James and Metallica models and biggest bands, Ron Wood of the Rolling Stones and shit. And he always treated, you know, little old Jeremy Wagner or Broken Hope like fucking gold. So I'm really, That's I mean, good, man. that says a lot about both of yeah. them. But big part of my history right here. It all started with seeing a guitar like this and going, what the hell is ESP? That looks sick. Yeah, yeah. Jeremy, what color is that? It's called. This is considered. They call it turquoise. Turquoise. Yeah. Wow. Because it almost. I, I mean, you can't tell. I think you know. It kind of might be like beach or something. You know. It's like I got another one. I I, I did a post not long ago of another ESP. Um, a a satelli shape. Same era. Oh, yeah. Seven. Eighty seven. And it's oh, yeah. that one's also called turquoise, and they don't really. Yeah. Look, they look similar, but not. So I don't know how they come up with these the names. Yeah, yeah. it almost looks kind of like a nostalgic strat, like that surf green. It, yeah, I mean, at least through the video, it looks like. Yeah. Now, when it comes just to just a little brighter colors, I just got this. So, uh, in all fairness, as I am always still an ESP loyalist, but I'm also a guitar freak, and I like. Yeah different <laughs> kinds of guitars for different reasons. Yeah. And this is this is a crazy color. This is a sparkle sparkle purple guitar. And my other aside from ESP, one of my favorite companies is Jackson. I mean, you know, it, maybe it's cuz of ESP's Jackson style headstock. Oh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but they I would just kind of make the strings a bit. made, but this is called the Jackson Wild Card. And um, oh, yes. look at that! Crazy? Like, look at the contours. It's almost like a yeah, kind of like a 
but the is that like 27 frets or something or yeah you see how that the fretboard goes off at an angle the yeah. Single yeah. yeah it's got one it's got one one inlay here here uh -huh. yep. and uh reverse headstock but um what year is that this is new this is like 20, oh that's new this is 2024 yeah that looks like it's right out of the eighties. This, this is my newest guitar, actually. I just got this just a little bit last week. Gorgeous. And I should I I'll give a shout out to uh, uh, Diablo Guitars. I think they're in Washington. Yeah. Um, they got some sick fucking guitars that they sell, and I don't know. It's just popped up, and um, uh. And Roger and Alex, uh, contrary to my usual love of one pickup, obviously it's got this, but I just love the way that. But it's hot. It's <laughs> hot with that angle. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I, and this neck is just sick. And and I don't know, it's such a crazy finish, too. You know, yeah. Kirk Hammett had yeah. a sparkly Kirk Hammett purple, sparkled purple or something guitar that came out, I think two or three years ago or something then it i don't have one of those but that kind of reminded mm -hmm. me so i got this for fun but this thing plays uh really great scott that thing uh, is beautiful uh, this, one is, this one has democracy in it so, and then mm -hmm. um since we're i keep showing you guitars i got one guitar here that um it's got a cool backstory to it and um, usually the, the reason this, this guitar, your, the timing of this interview is good because this guitar would probably be up North in that vault right now, but there's a really awesome, uh, guitar tech, uh, down here in Florida who there's a store in Miami, a music store called Walt Grace Vintage. And I met a guitar tech there who, um, I became friends with when I first started doing my snowbird thing in Miami beach, um, about seven years ago. And when I got down here and I knew I'd be in the future here, half the year, I'm like, I need someone that can work on guitars, you know, like I do back home. I got guys right. my, I've had for years and there's a guy named, uh, his name's Alex Jones, and he worked worked at Walt Grace Vintage. And then he went off and started his own thing. And I, since he worked with me, he, he was such a great tech, um, I always stuck with him. So when he went off on his own, I give him all my business here. Mm -hmm. And he just sent me a text um, last, <clears throat> last Wednesday, I think. It was a screenshot. It's like, hey, Alex, um, can you give me a call, man? I, I want you to swing by my house. I need you to do some work on shit. And it was fucking Ying Fei texting him. Like, he sent me the screenshot because he's like, because he's like us, you know, like you kind of nerd out on that. She's like, oh, fucking cool. Is this, dude? Yeah, yeah. He's hitting me up. So my tech works on Ying Fei stuff. He's oh, really good. No, cool. But anyway, the reason I men mention Alex Jones and all this stuff is um, in 2022, Steve I did an auction where he parted with like 40 guitars, a bunch of amps and equipment and all this stuff. And all the money went to this one organization or charity. I feel bad. I don't remember the name, but you can look it up. It's like Julian's auctions did the Steve I auction and, Went, went to a really good cause. And Steve Vai is one of my favorite guitar players of all time. Back when I was taking guitar lessons with uh, Tom Bradner and learning modes and arpeggios and speed runs and all that stuff, uh, Guitar World Magazine had this issue uh, with Steve Vai, who I worship Steve Vai since seeing him in Crossroads, uh, the movie, yeah. and as Jack Butler, the devil's guitar player yeah. and, um and then when he released um uh you know i had his solo stuff like flexible and um 
when he played for David Lee Roth, I fucking loved his work with David Lee Roth. Yeah. Just in his philosophy towards the guitar and stuff, just like, I just, I love Steve Vai. I worship that guy to this day. And like Guitar World Magazine, I still have it somewhere. They had a, what they would call the 10 hour guitar workout. Steve Vai's 10 hour guitar oh, workout. Yeah. And anyway, long time fan. And um, fast forward to now, 2022, uh, two years ago, he, he had this auction and I'm like, oh, I'll see what, what, what he's selling. And so I actually got a couple instruments, but one thing that was kind of like goes hand in hand with like how I feel about those old ESPs, call it Jeremy Wagner's guitar nostalgia <clears throat> or something like Steve, I had this crazy um, fire guitar. It was like shaped like a flame. It was like yes. it was raw hey. uh, that guitar actually got stolen uh, way back in the day with a bunch of other of Steve's guitars. And I don't think it ever resurfaced, but. Um, Performer, right? They were called performers, I believe, right? That that guitar? Okay. Oh, is really? Yeah, I don't remember. I don't know. It was yeah. like it had a, it had like a um, uh, light colored fretboard, and it was like red and like little yellow, like like a flame, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. I remember the guitar. And, and he's, not, he, he's like, uh, I think maybe. Um, maybe Guitar World or Guitar Player or something back in the day in the 80s, he, he was on the cover of one of those mags with it. So yeah, anyway, yeah. this luthier I never even heard of called Ren, W-R-E-N, made him a tribute guitar of that, of the flame guitar that got stolen. God knows where it is now, but I just wanted to share that since I'm yeah. here, you know, yeah. The guitar gear locker, if you find yeah. it, is, yeah. this is one I got at auction. I think it's really fucking fun. And and the reason I again I have it, and I mentioned Alex Jones, the Miami, Florida guitar tech that does all my stuff here. This guitar is actually um kind of in rough shape. Like it would mm -hmm. needed some fret work and some other stuff. Uh it's one I don't think like I've never seen Steve Vai play it. I've never seen it right. in a picture or anything, but it was, it was really rad. And, um, it, and it's not like it sold for a fortune or anything. It's not like, a, you know, I bought Eric Clapton's fucking guitar, you know, that <laughs> or David Gilmore's black strat. Yeah, this is yeah, probably right. going to saw. So, um, they were super hard. affordable. The, the bottom line, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Seven figures affordable. Yeah, right. Um, but this one, um, just it looked it looked fun. I like the backstory about it because it's related to that that flame guitar that got stolen that I always thought was just cool as hell. And and at the end of the day, all the money went to this great organization that Steve cared about. So anyway, oh, nice. that's how I got it. And that's the backstory. This thing. It's fucking this kind of it's just crazy, man. So this is called that's Ooh, wow. I mean yeah, it looks yeah. like it's almost written on the fretboard on that thing. But the fretboard wow. is Look like at that. that. This all has all all the new frets are replaced, and then this is the oh, uh, wow. And it's wow, just, that is that's insane. insane. And Roger and Alex that's really cool. nice. One pickup, one picture. That's the only reason I wanted it. <laughs> uh, this thing is awesome. wacky. And I just got this back from Alex, uh, my tech, and um, mm -hmm. I had, had to uh, plug it in and stuff. But wow, it's fucking that, is, crazy. that is nice. It's supposed Super to be cool. a, a tribute to Steve Vai's uh, flame guitar from the 80s that got stolen. And uh, it's just cool, man. You know? I like it. That is nice. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, again, I'm on the Guitar Gear Locker podcast with you boys. And yeah. got to uh, have guitars. Show you some fun stuff, you know? So, yeah. You know, so. Speaking about guitars, I mean, I, uh, and we're talking about, you know, vintage guitars. And, you know, I believe 
you know, there's magic in certain instruments that gets passed on. And you were you were mentioning, um, you know, mm -hmm. Kirk Hammett with the Greenie, you know, was Peter Green and then Gary Moore. And, you know, and now Kirk has it. So you think about all the great music that's been made on that instrument, the inspiration of that instrument. So I know yeah. you own you know, one of Hanneman's, his old Jackson, I believe, which yeah. I've seen him play with that guitar live. Uh, back yeah. in, I, maybe maybe the first time I saw him bring that guitar, it may have been South of Heaven tour or something. Mm -hmm. He was playing like a Bassy Rich Strat, and he had that Jackson. I'm pretty sure he had. Yeah. But, um, you know, you know, playing that guitar. Do, do you sometimes you, you just kind of think like, oh, you know, all the amazing songs that were made, and yeah. how that gets passed on inspiration? Because I, I I believe in that. You know, I think in different oh. guitars, there's songs and there's there's I, inspiration. Instrument. I I I uh, I believe in that big time. That mojo, if you will, mixed with well, the mojo. I was going to say mixed with history, but the the history itself is the mojo, if you follow me. Because yeah, yeah, definitely. That guitar, um, um, you know, if you think about it. Um, like <clears throat> I've got, um, in my, in my collection, like, um, this is actually the first time, like I've ever done like an extensive talk about some of the guitars I have. So like, I've got guitars like from Steve Vai and JJ, the great JJ Kale. If anyone knows J.J. Kale, he wrote like mm -hmm. all the great songs that Clapton covered, like right, you know, yeah, after midnight. Right. Um, and guitars, um, uh, I got a, I've got this really wacky guitar that was used on uh, Neil Young Harvest album because I'm a, I oh wow, him. and it, yeah, right it's crazy in this amp. It, like there's a, if you'll see the, there's a band picture. From Harvest, and you can actually see this amp uh, and this guitar leaning against it. So that I have that that amp and that guitar, um, and other you know whatever. I've got some guitars from other guys and stuff, but um, um, the thing. And, and by the way, like I get approached a lot, like just through messages and stuff. Hey, would you be interested in this or that? Like I only. I don't collect guitars just to collect them. There's got to be some special connection. Why? There's like, to be a connection or a tie to it. Right. Because like yeah. BJ Kale is a, it, such, was such a great songwriter and such just, just an amazing talent. And he, um, I always wanted a Dobro. So uh, this Dobro, that JJ Kale had came up for auction. And I, so I got something JJ Kale had who I think the world of, and I got a Dobro out of it. You know what I mean? Right. Right. Like with the, like the Hanneman guitars, as much as like Hanneman's probably, you know, I really haven't talked about Slayer much in this interview, but as much as Ride the Lightning changed my life out of any, guitar player, I think Jeff Hanneman probably influenced me the most, you know, but I will say this, if Jeff Hanneman, all he played were Gibson Les Pauls, you know, I don't know if I'd be motivated to have a bunch of Jeff Hanneman Les Pauls because yeah, yeah. I'm just fucking weird that way. Like, there's got to be, it's one part aesthetic and one part different meanings for me. And, and here's the thing, when I got some of Jeff's guitars, his widow, Catherine Hanneman, had said, promise me that you'll play these guitars because Jeff would want these guitars played. He wouldn't want them, you know. I've said this in other areas, hanging up at a, a hard rock, you know. Yeah, definitely. Uh, 
or fucking put in storage and, you know, flipped fucking nine yeah. years. Old, you know what I mean? And yeah. um, he uh, just like Kirk Hammett and other people, like I'm, I like like a strat style type of body and just like most of his ESPs and that Jackson, you know, I'm a long time Jackson guy that those were guitars like that aesthetically pleased me. And the other, so the other, so one thing is um, my point, I guess I'm getting at is like, um, I count my promise. I, I play these guitars. Um, but again, like, uh, like I'm just not into Les Pauls or some other body shape or style. You know what I mean? Regardless, yeah, yeah. like I'll tell you that. Like I fucking worship uh, early, obviously early James Hetfield. You know, ride the white mm -hmm. man for puppets. I wouldn't necessarily know if I'd want James Hetfield fucking explorer. And someone watching yeah. this. I'll be like, are you fucking insane? What do you mean you wouldn't want James Hetfield? It's like, just not, I don't know, man. It's not for me. It doesn't speak to you. It doesn't speak to me. You just said yeah. it perfectly. It, it, Hanneman's guitars speak to me. The other thing mm -hmm. I did, aside from promising to, you know, take care of the guitars for, in Jeff's uh, honor, name, legacy, what Catherine asked me, to do is the last Broken Hope album. I used two of Jeff's guitars to to track that entire album. Recorded nice. only with Jeff's guitars. One was the Jackson, and one was um, an ESP guitar that <clears throat> I call the God Hates Us All guitar because he got it right around God Hates Us All, and it, it's the only guitar I've ever seen him with as a reverse headstock, and right. that's why. You remember, Alex, when you asked, is there a guitar in my collection that when I play it has mojo? And I said, yeah, my main number one Broken Hulk guitar. Mm -hmm. There's another one almost up there, and it's that fucking um, uh, ES uh, yeah. custom with the reverse headstock. Dude, yeah. that guitar just, there's something about it. Like, fuck wow. it, it plays and it feels, it's indescribable almost but that all said that hanneman hanneman's jackson it's the fucking crown jewel out of all the guitars i have period all of them the crown mm -hmm. jewel because the history the provenance on mm -hmm. that guitar i mean if you're like me as a teenager not only seeing Slayer live, you saw him play that back in the eighties. He acquired it yeah. right, right after Rain and Blood, right before, right around South of Heaven, like eighty-seven. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. was the first guitar that, at the time, if I remember what Catherine told me, was that guitar was the most expensive guitar like Jeff ever paid for maybe oh, wow. I, I know he had saved work the job to buy that that Les Paul that he always had you know as a kid mm -hmm. kind of like I didn't yeah, yeah. save money for my first DSP but I think the Jackson like they didn't give him an, an endorsement or anything you know and by right. then they already had a number of albums on were really making a name for themselves and Jackson did give Jeff an, an endorsement so he bought that soloist with his own cash you know um mm -hmm. I don't know what it over a thousand dollars or something back then and he stickered it up and for me like every fucking magazine metal mag i ever pick up had that guitar in it posters um and it's been on stage everywhere you know from budokan to wembley like um yeah um what you call it what's the the music video uh, i'm trying to think now Oh shit! War, War ensemble, maybe is it? War ensemble, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So in that video. Um, it's just like you know, between photos of Slayer's history and videos, that's was such a predominant guitar because that was Jeff's main guitar after he paid for it. You know, and right. um, 
and uh, just, yeah, there's, it's, it's just extremely special. One thing I'd like to mention too, um, with Jeff Hanneman's guitars, like <clears throat> when I said I, I play the guitars and keep that promise of, you know, what Catherine Hanneman said Jeff would want, he'd want these instruments played and not neglected, is no. some of the guitars, like I haven't even changed the strings. And oh, that's cool. when I play them, I play them very carefully because some of like Jeff's DNA is on those guitars. Yeah. Like, and, yeah. And I'm really quirky, weird about that. Like, I don't want to like, um, I don't know, like redo, re like rework these guitars. You know what I mean? Like fucking mm -hmm. change, change all the strings or clean them up or fuck with anything. Period. Really, you know. Yeah, yeah. I try to, I'm all about preservation. So on one hand, if it's not like I play them all the time either, but I will say they're always predominantly displayed in my vault. Mm -hmm. I got this big window, like people that visit can see in my vault, basically, you know, it's like a big right. fucking fish tank. And um, they, uh, the legacy of Jeff Hanneman to me is like paramount, carrying on his legacy and Absolutely. It's not like I bought some people out there who don't know shit think like I bought every guitar Jeff Hanneman ever had. And um, that's not true. You know, I would love to have every guitar Jeff had, but um, I've got enough. And, um, and what I have uh, really mean a lot to me. Jeff's again, Jeff's spirit, spirit in black means a lot to me and yeah. uh, and I have a whole Hanneman room and I'm a fucking nerd about it but I, get, I got this Hanneman room with a bunch of his personal effects on display and every like Slayer flyers going back to from when they were in high school to handbills from concerts the posters and um, you know I, I guess basically in a nutshell uh, when I promise something i not only keep my word but I, I take things an extra fucking mile you know so it says a lot yeah. about you too and then i really i really feel i kept that promise and it's like legit. Awesome. um yeah. i might not be the guitar player i am today because of that influence he was the guy when i told you i wrote lyrics it was because of jeff hanneman writing lyrics not being a singer but writing lyrics and then this my favorite sickest riffs of Slayer writ, were written by Hanneman. I'm like, right. that's what I fucking want to do, what Jeff Hanneman's doing. Right? Sick riffs and lyrics. So, yeah, he had a huge, profound impact on me, and mm -hmm. wherever, whatever the universe did to put me in the right place at the right time to have this, um, I take it so seriously that, you know, I carry that torch. So, yeah. Yeah, it's important to me. You know, I don't yeah. see anyone else ever doing anything on that level, you know. Yeah. For and Jeff. you know how you say about lyrics, you said that Jeff's lyrics inspired you. So, you know, there's another part of you that a lot of people don't know. It's you're you're a novelist, you're a writer. Yeah. And uh, you know, and I think, you know, for me, all these things, whether it's creating music or writing books. Um, it's all it's all inspiration. It's all being creative. It's a positive force. I, I feel yeah, and uh, we're all connected. And in one way or another, like the your writing did that come around the same time as playing the instrument, or did that come later? You know, being inspired to, to write books and, and you know, and you're also writing history, you know, about people too. I know that yeah. you have some stuff that works, and um, you know, is it was that. Did that come later or was that, was that early on? That's a great question. Um, I, when you think, when I think about it, like what came first, writing or music, um, or playing an instrument, I should say, um, writing definitely came first. So I was, cause I was such, um, 
again, going back to childhood in Wisconsin, I was such a bookworm and so um, just such an avid reader at a very, very young age. I went from, you know, Dr. Seuss books to reading adult novels that my mom had. My mom always had a taste. She still does for horror and mystery and dark fiction. So, um, and I was always, uh, I always say I was a horror kid. So like, I'd look at the covers to these paperbacks my mom had and just be like transfixed by the cover. And, um, and I was just so, again, so into books and reading that by like say 1975, 76, like I was reading my mom's books and like the first adult novel I ever read was the paperback edition of Jaws by Peter Benchley. Oh yeah. And, and then um right after that, man, I I started, I was like so like stimulated. I wanted to write my own stories. And um, I still have this to this day. My grandmother gave me um, a, a, this book, like about the size of about the size of a trade paperback, but a hard. It's got it has a hard cover, and it's it's like wrapped in denim, like a like like jeans, you know, with it's got a pocket on it, and it says my book. And when you open it, all the it it's like uh, all lined pages. And she gave that to me. And then it was the, in that thing, I started writing my first um, stories. So huh. like, right. like my first story, I short story I tried writing was about like, um, I was really, well, I still am into dinosaurs in paleontology. So it was like a story about these guys go back in time and there's fucking dinosaurs and shit. And then like, <laughs> next story in it is like um like jaws three before jaws three ever was actually a movie or anything so right. like so yeah. um my my writing started in grade school you know before i ever picked up an instrument and then when i became a guitarist um as a teenager you know especially by 16 super serious and, and whatnot um i was like I told told you, I was writing or still writing short stories in dark poetry and lyrics, you know. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was like almost a natural, you know, coming together of two things I loved: writing and music, you know, with with lyrics and music. And then outside of music, um, the other thing, you know, I don't know. I always use analogies and shit, but like. Think of a yin and yang symbol. Yeah. Well, for in my life, one half of the yin yang is writing books, and the other right. half is writing riffs and music. Those are uh -huh. the two, those are my two big muses. Uh, are, right. are so. Um, you sound I, like I, a busy guy. I don't I, know what you do in your spare time because you can't have much. <laughs> it's like I'm trying to not have nine irons in the fire i got it it's there's been too much shit man the past two years because it's not just writing books and music i i got uh i have a production company that has two yeah. documentary films that are probably coming out later this year or next year i got yeah. a high -high production company to write and create a tv series so i wrote a pilot script in 10 episodes um for like the first season that, and this is just something I got hired to do. And then, um, yeah, I got the two bands and shit. And it wasn't long ago, Roger, like I'm talking in January after the new year, right. um, I was like, I gotta put the brakes on doing too much shit. Cause uh, it's like a case of careful what you wish for. Cause it's like, right. I always wanted to write scripts and, make films and write books and make music and all this stuff. And yeah. And, and I own a indie publishing house on top of it. So, but that, that is now more self-sufficient. I've got people running it, you know, yeah. and, and whatnot, but 
the point is, it's kind of, again, careful what you wish for, because um, I've done it all, all the stuff I wanted to try, you know, again, mm -hmm. uh, being able to write as a career, um, making films, writing scripts, and again, doing music. And now, yeah, it's too fucking much. Like you said, Roger, like you, you just hear me writing books and music. How do I have time? All yeah. that other shit. I don't even know how I do it all or did it all. I put the brakes on. I just really right. want to focus on back to just writing my own books and doing my band stuff. But, right. but um, it sounds like you're enjoying what you're doing, right? I do. I do. I, oh yeah. Means a lot, man. Abs absolutely. And I encourage anyone that, isn't doing what they love to take a step back and make life count and really do what yeah. you do it do what you love and don't listen yeah. to either a naysayer or your inner voice saying oh i can never do that one i'd still be writing books and music if it wasn't a career you know because i mm -hmm. passion too passion yeah. is what's legit what were the therein lies integrity and where, where your heart's all about integrity so i'd still write books and music even if i didn't have a publishing deal or a record deal right right so right my I, I just like to encourage other people to make your life count do it because yeah, you're yeah. about it and yeah. if you become successful in one way shape or form that's a friggin bonus you know but um, yeah. i've got two books coming out um, I've got a new novel, a really fucked up horror novel called Wretch. <laughs> That's something I can't wait. That's like, oh, I think you were telling me about this. Yeah, I yeah. Think this is, right? yeah. Oh, tough. That's coming Sorry. out in October. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wrote a different, I wrote, I actually um, kind of spread my wings with, uh, as far as being a writer. Like, you know, I writing scripts was a really cool experience for me because writing a movie script and a tv series script is different than writing a, a novel or a short story it's a different format and different ang angle and um uh that was a great exercise as a writer but the other thing i've been getting into is uh i've got a few things i've done that are more nonfiction. so i have a memoir <clears throat> i wrote for a, a really well-known chef named chef curtis duffy and is that memoir is coming out in September, I believe. But hit really, um, really amazing life stories. Like his life story, I would say is like Sons of Anarchy meets Anthony Bourdain, Kitchen Confidential. It's really? yeah. He grew up in a biker household, and his dad was in a bike gang, and and he turned stuffy like navigated through all kinds of chaos and crazy shit and became like a three Michelin star chef over and over again. Like he's, it's amazing. So anyway, those are coming out and yeah, got the earth burner album probably coming out in July and new broken hope album written, but um, Roger, I I'm doing what I love, but I'm, I'm doing things at my own pace now. That, that's all that matters, brother. Iron in the fire. And there's more life. Me too, irons in the fire. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what? You, you know when you're doing too much? What's that? I, I said, you know when you're doing too much and you need to back oh, it down? As long as you're having fun, man, hammer down. Yeah, exactly. Right. You got to know your limitations. Don't stress yourself out and just, you know, yeah. move at your own pace, you know. Yeah. Do what you want. Are, so I have to, Alex, you know, I have to do this, man. I have to veer off the guitar path and on to sharks. My wife <laughs> is a shark fanatic. Your wife I, is? My wife is. She absolutely is. Uh, before you came on, I, she wanted me to show you a picture of it, but I, I didn't want to do it. So we have in our guest bathroom, we have Jaws, toilet paper holder with the toilet paper in his mouth. What really? She is a shark. <laughs> you know, I'm a huge Jaws fan. 
Like, I, I saw a, it. I have a Jaws video. Did you see the YouTube video? I did. I and not only that, usually when I'm preparing for I things, even I don't have a Jaws toilet roll holder. Oh, my God. You, you don't know what you're missing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, awesome. she... When I met her, I found out like her car was called, she had like a little white Subaru. She had, it, it was called, like a white shark or something like that. She had a dog, which I hated, by the way. Uh, and he hated me equally. His name was Sharky. Uh, and I was like, man, what's up with this chick that likes sharks? But yeah, she's a shark fanatic. When I watched that interview with you showing your museum, yeah. I, I she actually watched it. She never watches these things with me. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. like, that I appreciate you checking that out. That was awesome to do. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you have a Jaws. lot of cool stuff. The greatest Jaws fan site in the world, the Daily Jaws. That's who I yeah. think. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah, that, that was cool. We both enjoyed it. I had to say something about it. It's not a guitar, but, I mean, sharks <laughs> are cool. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, they are. Another thing I've been fascinated with since childhood are Primarily great white sharks. I, yeah, that, that's white exactly sharks where she in, is. In general, but yeah, I've had a thing about great white sharks since I was probably, again, three or four years old. Yeah. Great yeah, white yeah. sharks, horror movies, dinosaurs, all that shit. Some shit for me has never changed, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's all cool stuff, right? Yeah. It's so, great. And then, then the guitars, you know, we were talking about... Uh, you know, guitars, cool guitars, mojo and all that, man, there is nothing. I don't care if it's a famous Jeff Hanneman or if it's just a regular Joe with a cool guitar story. I love it. Yeah. There's nothing better, man. I get a lot of guys that come in here and they'll just have like their childhood guitar that means a lot to them or just, you know, a cool story with a cool guitar. You, yeah. you just can't beat it. Dude, I, I love stories like that as well. I like I yeah. like. I like uh, I like a really I just like a good story, even a human journey yeah. story. But then like yeah. a story behind a guitar, um, yeah. whether it's my neighbor or uh, so, so whatever it is, that's always interesting. Mm -hmm. When you get right. to that, the meaning of what that guitar is for somebody, you know what I mean? Right. Well, yep. Of course, yep. you brought it up. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like. I really appreciate that kind of thing too. Here yeah, that, yeah. You know, like what what it means. You know. What yeah, that I mean, is. you you could probably see that guitar right there. It's just yeah. a it's a a California series Telecaster. It's just a Telecaster, but it it's not about the guitar. The dude that owned it was a super cool guy, and super cool story with it. And that that means more than a guitar, you know. Yeah, and I you you said you left some of the DNA and you didn't want to change anything, and that one there, it, and it it was a um it was a family member uh by marriage um into the uh, Delta Blues and all that, and it still has where he um uh, he drumbled out for the pit guard, and I've left everything like it was when he did it. Wow, that's so, awesome! Just a cool story behind a, a guitar, you know? Yeah, yeah. And those those memories and that meaning is on another. Yeah too i mean that's yeah that's and you put all those together and it's it's almost magical when you get all that together the mojo cool guitar cool story it's magical yeah. Yeah. nobody else would understand it it is yeah i totally, I totally get it man i take that yeah. Heart. Yeah. yeah yeah definitely this has yeah. been cool yeah yeah i mean you know this will wrap up and we, you know we've covered a lot of stuff First, yeah, I just want to thank you for coming on. And Absolutely. Also, I, you know, I hope for any, especially you know, young kids that you know are watching this and you know hearing your story and, and all the things that you know you that you do, um, you know that inspires some kids to go out there and and do what you're passionate about because you know if more people. Or doing things that they love would be it's going to be a lot nicer place too i think because you know yeah. unfortunately there's a lot of people that you know they're they're, they're unhappy in their lives and, and uh you know and some people are just afraid you know to to go out and um you know accomplish things and, and really yeah they have fear and i i just hope that this inspires them in some way because yeah. i think it might be the same for you when you were young we don't we don't think about these things we don't 
think about, you know, inspiring other people with music. We just want to go out and play music because we were inspired by all these other guys. And, and, then, and to be able to do that now and inspire some younger kids to go out and accomplish their dreams, you know, and uh, not, it, it doesn't matter if it's music, if it's writing, if it's painting, whatever it is, if you want to go out and plant the grass out in the backyard, I don't care what it is, you know, whatever it is that makes people happy. You know, and I think you have a very inspiring story. And, uh, you know, I love hearing this kind of stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and you as a person, you're a very positive guy. You're an awesome person. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I just I hope this inspires some of the people who are watching it, you know. Me Absolutely. Too. Well said. Well said. Yeah, yeah Alex. Yeah. You, man, what you, you said, I... Just now, it's like uh, the the way I roll. I really, um, you know, like anyone else, I have my bad days and shit that you know gets me down or whatever. But the way I try to roll uh, outwardly, no matter what's going on inside, is I always try to be really positive, you know, mm -hmm. and and exude positivity. And the other thing mm -hmm. that I like to do. Uh, again, along the lines of what you just said, are I love to in, encourage and inspire people, yeah, uh, especially young people, but a, a, everyone too, in general. And, yeah. and um, I like to also promote what you said, which is you know, don't, don't let naysayers or negative people ever tell you you can't do something and you'll never do that. Unfortunately, also to your point, there's a lot of miserable people out there and who knows why they're miserable. All right. But people that try to grind you down and, and say, you'll never do this. You won't do that. Or even diss you for what you do artistically, yeah. or if you're a landscaper planting the grass, they diss yeah. you for whatever you're passionate about. Um, these are people who are miserable. They don't have ambition. They never yeah. believed in themselves. And that sucks, you know, because yeah. I'd like to see the world become a nicer place with everyone being happy, you yeah. know, yeah. they love. So maybe if more people did make the effort to do what they loved because they're passionate about it, Remove that fear of failure. Remove that fear that you mentioned, period. And just go yeah. for it. People, a lot more people could find joy. And I, corny as it sounds, the world could be a better place. And to that end, that's why while I'm here, I try to be an antidote to the negativity, to be an antidote to miserable, petty. Yeah, yeah frankly yeah. and always be good to people and again especially with the younger people who are hopefully as you said watching this man you can do anything in in, in the yeah. world do what you love yeah. because you really like to do it if it becomes a career that's even better and cooler but no yeah. matter what even if you don't make a living at doing whatever it is do what you love to do and yeah. find Don't happiness stop. because you can't put a price on happiness. And yep. we get one lap around the track of life. And I say, make mm -hmm. it count, make that lap count. And yeah. Yeah, yeah. I can be happy. And again, just, you know, I was a kid right on a school bus with kids who smelled like cow manure from the central Wisconsin and all kinds of things happen over my life because the great thing is for me writing books and music and traveling and it's all because frankly I believed in myself and I never listened mm -hmm. to naysayers. I always thought there's a reason there's a Stephen King and there's a reason you know that there was a Jimi Hendrix whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, it's because. But, let, but let's face it, you don't have a shortage for motivation. I, I don't know you that well, but I could tell that you don't have a shortage for motivation yeah. at and, all. And, and, and it isn't going to fall in your lap, in other words. 
And then aside from in, encouraging and inspiring people, I definitely like to motivate people. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's all I have to say. And I guys, I couldn't thank you enough for this interview. And what a great way yeah. to wrap up this interview. And thanks Absolutely. for watching. Talk your freaking ears off, because God knows <laughs> it's been great, on. man. It's I'm it's fun to sit listening. Sorry, and I won't shut up. <laughs> no, well, it, it's funny because I sit here and I try to think of questions. So it's like, well, shit, this is so fascinating. I don't even want to interrupt it. <laughs> well, I, I got to tell you, I had a blast talking to you guys today. And again, yeah. thanks for the opportunity. And when this yeah, comes man. Out, I can't wait to uh, share it with everyone, too. So keep me in the yeah. loop whenever it's. Yeah, we'll do, man. 